What up, y'all? It's Andrew Defy, a.k.a. the Gorilla Poet Laureate, a.k.a. the Hoodie God, a.k.a. Spitting Quarantino, a.k.a. I wear my sunglasses at night indoors because my eyes are sensitive as my heart is, y'all. And we are here with another episode of Masked Up, a community health live stream. We have an incredible show for you tonight. I have Dr. Keith Norris in the spot coming by to talk to us. And y'all know the reason we started off the way that we started off tonight is because it is Black History Month. All February, we're going to be bringing you Black medical history that you may not have known about. And that's how we wanted to start it off. We wanted to start it off with Solomon Fuller. Now, we talked a little bit last week about Tuskegee. I want to clear it up because, uh, you know, did say that he worked at Tuskegee. Following the First World War, Fuller was appointed to recruit and train African-American psychiatrists to staff the new VA Medical Center for African-Americans in Tuskegee. This medical center later became the site of the notorious Tuskegee experiments. But from 1932 to 1972, when Fuller was there, Tuskegee, with all its African-American medical staff, was considered advanced for the segregated VA. So shout out to Solomon Fuller and all of his work being the first African-American psychiatrist recognized by the American Psychiatric Association. Hats off there. Um, so we got a lot to we got a lot to cover this week. Um, we're going to we're going to start off like we always do with the weekly Rona update. So our first story comes to us from the LA Times. There was quite a stir in LA over the weekend. Dodger Stadium's mass COVID-19 vaccination site was shut down Saturday afternoon as dozens of protesters gathered at the entrance, stalling hundreds of motorists who had been waiting in line for hours. The Los Angeles Fire Department closed the entrance to the stadium at about 2 p.m. as a precaution, officials said. The demonstrators included members of anti-vaccine and far-right groups. While some carried signs decrying the COVID-19 vaccine and shouting for people not to get the shots, there were no incidents of violence. This is completely wrong, said German Jacques, who drove from his home in Laverne and had been waiting for an hour for his vaccination when the stadium's gates were closed. He said some of the protesters were telling people in line that the coronavirus is not real and that the vaccination is dangerous. Y'all. We've talked numerous times on this show that it is okay to have your belief pro or your belief anti. Here is an open place for conversation. What we're not going to do, what we're not going to do is stop people from exercising their rights. You know what I'm saying? L.A. wilding out a little bit. You know what I mean? Come down. Come down, L.A. <laughs> this next one, some good some good news in, in Rona coming out of San Diego saying entertainment is back. Musicians and comedians are ready to safely take the stage. On Monday, when Governor Newsom lifted the stay-at-home orders statewide, some businesses were given the green light to turn on the spotlight for live entertainment. It's the first time that these performers have been included in the purple tier. From musicians to comedians, the entertainment industry has been hit hard during the pandemic. Workers haven't been allowed to book in-person live gigs locally since the first lockdown in March 2020. After the governor lifted the stay-at-home orders, San Diego County Board Chairman Nathan Fletcher clarified that live entertainment would be allowed at restaurants or places that serve food outdoors. Performers must keep a distance of 12 feet between the audience and other performers on stage. Did we say 12 feet? I meant 20 feet with an astronaut helmet on, you know, just to be safe. I just want y'all to be safe. You know what I mean? Uh, so that's that's our that's our weekly Rona update. You know, what I mean, things are things are going in a in a good direction. Y'all have been with me when they weren't going in such a great direction. So uh, it's it's nice to be able to provide you with some some good news on uh, the lady Rona. So, uh, yeah, that's our that's our weekly Rona update. And now on to the latest health news. And 
this first story, I thought I thought it was really, really interesting and really timely with all of this going on. It's from the CommonwealthFund.org. Came out on the 27th of January, talking about addressing social isolation and loneliness. Lessons from around the world. Because social isolation is the objective lack of social ties or social contact, while loneliness is the subjective feeling of being lonely or having inadequate social support. These terms have been thrust into the limelight as the world grapples with the COVID-19 pandemic. Social isolation comes at a price. It is associated with roughly $6.7 billion in additional health care costs annually among Medicare beneficiaries and contributes to poor health outcomes, including a 50% increased risk of early mortality. Even before the pandemic, 22% of adults in the United States were experiencing social isolation or loneliness, and organizations were beginning to address the issue. Countries across the globe have been implementing programs to curtail the effect of growing isolation. To explore lessons from these interventions, they conducted semi-structured interviews with 14 experts from the U.S. and abroad, including Australia, Canada, England, Estonia, France, Ireland, the Netherlands, and New Zealand, to identify factors that contributed to or hindered the success. Here's what we learned. Tailor programs to people's needs. Build with, not for. Identify policy supports to sustain the programs. Sustainability is key. Use the infrastructure of existing community services and address gaps in evidence. The COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting physical distancing orders have exacerbated a global epidemic of social isolation and loneliness, highlighting the importance of finding and scaling creative strategies to generate social connections. As policymakers and researchers strive to combat loneliness and isolation in the United States, particularly during these challenging times, they should look to and learn from experts engaged in this work across the globe. And the loneliness is real. And y'all heard what the costs are. And that 22 percent of folks were dealing with that in the United States before the pandemic. What do those numbers look like now? Our next story, some exciting news coming from the American Chemical Society. Uh, new test coming out. We like to bring you these new tests as soon as they drop. Uh, this one's about antibiotics in your food, right? And now they are going to be able to find more of it, test more of it. Uh, so widespread use of antibiotics in human healthcare and livestock husbandry has led to trace amounts of the drugs ending up in food products. Long-term consumption could cause health problems, but it's been difficult to analyze more than a few antibiotics at a time because they have different chemical properties. Now, researchers reporting in ACS Journal of Agriculture and Food Chemistry have developed a method to simultaneously measure 77 antibiotics in a variety of foods. This is unheard of exponential growth here. This new method should help with understanding, monitoring, and regulating antibiotic levels in food, the researchers say. That's wild, y'all. That's wild, y'all. We're going to know how many antibiotics are out there. A lot of us don't even know. You know, it's really hard to test for. So that's some exciting, exciting news um, coming out of the American Chemical Society. So, um, you know, that uh, that brings us to the latest health news. And I mean, you saw you saw one early on. This is how we started the show. But I mean, February is a really short month. And there is a lot of black medical history to cover. So we're going to do it again. And do something to acknowledge this medical pioneer who died. Oh, oh, I think I, I think I forgot the I think I forgot the audio, y'all. I think I forgot the audio on that. Let me let me let me bring this back up. Let me bring this back up and let's do it right. If anything is worth doing, it's worth doing right. All right. Here we go. 
we are going to learn about Rebecca Crumpler, the first black woman awarded a medical degree from a U.S. college. We decided to take action and do something to acknowledge this medical pioneer who died 125 years ago. On Thursday, her grave finally received a proper headstone. Dr. Rebecca Lee Crumpler was the first black female physician in the U.S. I was told that people come looking for her, but she doesn't have her gravestone. There aren't even images of Dr. Crumpler, but she wrote this book, graduated from the New England Female Medical College in 1864 at what's now Boston University. People need to know her story. Dr. Melody McLeod is an OBGYN in Atlanta who helped fund an exhibit about Dr. Crumpler at BU, the alma mater they both share. When the Civil War ended, Dr. Crumpler moved to Virginia to treat recently freed slaves. The white doctors would not touch these recently freed slaves. So for her to do that, I just, I just think it's a remarkable story and she overcame all that. She survived and thrived. She was a pioneer. Absolutely. But more than 100 years later, only 5% of active physicians identify as Black or African American, and women make up around 2%. Last year, around 4,000 Black females enrolled in medical school, compared to about 22,000 white females. It's a predominantly white male um, institution, and I just think it's really positive that we are all here um, breaking into this institution. Sabria Parnell, Kaylise Green, and Rachel Ingraham are med students at BU now. It took Rachel eight years to get here after college. I didn't see myself reflected in physicians, so I didn't really know if I could do it. Do you think a lot of Black Americans get that message that, that this isn't something for you? Definitely. They also see the impact of decades of distrust of doctors in their community. If there is an institution you don't trust, why would you want to be a part of it? And the more that they can see someone that looks like them and trust, I think will also help break down some of the health disparities. Bringing more diversity to the field, they say, also creates role models. Black women are out there. We are surgeons. We're giving babies. So we need more. But I'm, I'm, I'm happy with what we've done, but we have a lot more to do. Dr. Crumpler was just the first of many. I think that we are standing on their shoulders and can make something new of what they have already brought to us. So the other little girls um, who come after us will hopefully build on what we are going to do in the future. Dr. McLeod told me she wants to see a statue of Dr. Crumpler in the state of Virginia. And so do we. We want to see a statue of Dr. Crumpler too. Yeah, 2.2% is not enough, y'all. That is not enough. We have a crisis. And it's called racism. Here we go. I got a really, really wild uh, study that came out of Tulane University um, about discrimination and how the healthcare system uh, can be super inequitable on all levels uh, for our black and brown family. Uh, Tulane University study finds discrimination may cause black and Hispanic patients to wait longer for a scheduled primary care appointment, according to a new Tulane University study published in JAMA Network Open. The research could shine more light on why people who belong to racial and ethnic minority groups experience worse health outcomes than white people in the United States. The research team recruited seven female callers who self-identified as non-Hispanic black, non-Hispanic white, or Hispanic. Each invented a pseudonym that they felt signaled their gender, racial, and ethnic identities, and that they felt comfortable using on the calls. The women called more than 800 primary care offices in Texas. Each time, the caller introduced herself by her pseudonym and asked to be scheduled for the next available appointment as a new patient. Callers did not proactively offer any additional information, but did answer any questions the scheduler asked using a standardized script. The study found black and Hispanic callers were more likely to be offered an appointment, but they were asked more frequently about their insurance status. Researchers found black callers were 44% more likely than white callers to be asked about their insurance status during the call. Hispanic callers were 25% more likely than white callers to be asked if they had insurance. 
The study also found patients belonging to racial and ethnic minority groups received appointments further in the future than white collars. Lead author of the study, Jana Wisniewski, Assistant Professor of Health Policy and Management at Tulane, said offices could reduce barriers to care with bias training and other mechanisms, such as automated scheduling systems. She hopes knowing the information will begin a conversation about overcoming bias in healthcare settings. This is not something that's routinely checked in hospitals and clinics, whether they're inadvertently discriminating based on race or ethnicity, Wisniewski said. Starting to even look at that and bring attention to it might be a good first step. And that is why we do what we do on this here live stream to make sure we are starting the conversations and bringing attention uh, to, to the history of the medical field so that we can, we can be accountable um, because through accountability comes change. So, you know, uh, shout out to Tulane University for doing that work. Um, so uh, this, this brings us to my favorite segment of this show. See, this is not just me. It is not just this person that you see in front of you. There, like with many great men, is a great woman behind me. And her name is Netta Ashtari. And she digs up some of the coolest stories that I have ever found or that I've ever read, that I've ever come across and been put onto. She just games me up constantly. So uh, this is a little segment that we like to call Net found this. So we have a very interesting uh, little video I'm going to show you here. This has to do with Man, this this gets really personal for me because I had a, a friend of mine um, tell me this exact story a few years ago. He was talking about, you know, he's he's a black man and he was telling me his daughter always picked out the white doll and they had to have a conversation with her about it. And she said the, the white doll was the pretty one. Um, and it broke my heart. It really broke my heart to hear that it's such a beautiful young woman. Um, and it just shows you like how ingrained this this training is. Um, so this is CNN's Anderson Cooper highlighting a project that reveals how children view racial beliefs, attitudes, and preferences as young as five. This is what we're talking about when we say systemic racism, y'all. If there wasn't a system enforcing and reinforcing these beliefs about white supremacy, then where would five-year-olds get these ideas, y'all? Go. Our second major finding, even black children as a whole have some bias toward whiteness, but far less than white children. She'll be the smart child. And why is she the smart child? Because she is white. Okay. Show me the dumb child. And why is she the dumb child? Because she plays. Well, show me the ugly child. And why is she the ugly child? Because she plays. Show me the good looking child. And why is she the good looking child? Because she likes skinny. And show me the skin color you believe most teachers think looks bad on a girl. I don't think they think it matters. Because I think um, each teacher wants to help a student learn mm -hmm. either way what they look like. And yeah. It doesn't matter what you look like on the outside. It just matters what you look like on the inside. Show me the good looking child. Um, they look the same. Yeah. Show me the child you would like as a classmate. All of them. You like all of them as classmates? Why do you say all of them? Because I don't really care what um, color they have. This five-year-old girl gave some provocative answers during her test. I asked her about them later. Me too. Why, why do you want that skin color? Because it looks lighter than this kind, because this looks a lot like that one. Mm -hmm. yep. And I just don't like the way brown looks, because the way brown looks, looks really 
nasty for some reason, but I don't know what reason. Mm, that's all. So you think it looks nasty? Well, not really, but sometimes. Sometimes. And Brielle, they asked what color adults don't like. Do you remember what you said? Which one? That's right. That's what you said. Why do you think adults don't like that color? Dark. Dark. And adults, you think adults don't like dark? Well, maybe some adults do, but maybe some of them don't. Mm. The questions that got overwhelmingly white biased answers? Show me the one you think most children would think looks bad on a boy. More than 70% of the older black children chose the darkest skin tones. Show me the child who has the skin color most children don't like. More than 61% of the younger black children chose the two darkest shades. Show me the ugly child. More than 57% of the younger black kids chose the two darkest shades. Dr. Spencer says the research shows the bias toward white is still very much part of our culture. All kids are exposed to these stereotypes. But what's really significant here is that white children are learning or maintaining those stereotypes uh, much more strongly uh, than the African-American children. And that is our third finding, the finding that interested Dr. Spencer the most, that overall younger and older children keep the same patterns stereotyping. In other words, their ideas change little from age five to 10. Ordinarily, by the time children are older, there is sort of a natural filter you know, their own ways of thinking uh, sort of aids them in sort of rethinking the extreme stereotypic sort of responses to become less highly biased. That left Professor Spencer wondering what's causing this pattern. She speculates that kids are bombarded by stereotypical messages and that adults in kids' lives have to fight to override the deluge. Black parents may be more diligent about that, while white parents may not notice the need. The messages are the same for all children, and therefore the task is the same for all parents. Parents have to reframe what children experience. We realize these findings may be disturbing and that some people will question this project's conclusions. What stereotypic messages are being sent in a country that elected a black man president? Hi, Barack Hussein Obama. Like all research projects, ours is not perfect. Some kids were told ahead of time they'd be asked about race. Some children identified as one race, but came from biracial families, like this boy whose mom is white. But Professor Spencer tells us these are common issues in research, and the results can still be trusted because of the sample size. To be clear, this is a scientifically informed and executed pilot study, which suggests the need for further research. The results point to major trends, but are not the definitive word on children and race. Still, they underline what Dr. Spencer sees as an alarming conclusion. We are still living in a society where dark things are devalued and light things are valued. The question we're left with is, where do we go from here? Anderson Cooper, CNN. Y'all, it's on us. It's on us. You know, it's uh, it's on those of us who have kids and it's on those of us who don't. We got to change this whole thing up. Um, man, just, just heartbreaking, heartbreaking. So, uh, we give a, we give a special shout out to Netta for, for finding that study. Um, and again, it just like rang really, really close to home, uh, for me. And I know this to be, to be a reality among some of my family. So, um, let's, let's get to work on it, y'all. Let's get to work on it. You know what I mean? Uh, so now we have come we have come to the most exciting part of our show. I'm going to be joined by a most illustrious guest out here. Y'all, we have the one, the only, Dr. Keith Norris joining us. Dr. Norris. Andrew, how you doing? Man, I'm fantastic. I get to sit and have a conversation with you tonight. You're, um, you're like a rock star among the medical community. I don't know if you know that. No, I don't. I don't. It was cool. I was listening to the, you know, the orientation, the, the introduction and uh, Solomon Carter Fuller. And at the end, there was this quote from Anel Prim, who's 
a leading black psychiatrist uh, talking about Dr. Fuller. Uh, Anel was my classmate at Howard University. That's wow. Your name there. That's dope. That's dope. So, uh, you know, just to give the people a little bit of background, every article about you mentions not only your work in like the physical realm of medicine, because you're a, you're a leading expert nephrologist. Uh, that's he works with kidneys for the the people the people like me out here. Uh, but uh, they also mention everything really focuses on your community engagement history and and how much you've worked in community engagement. What does community engagement look like in the context of the medical profession? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, and it's something that um, is is sort of different in the medical profession. It's it's happening much more now, but it really used to just happen like in public health and nursing, social work, but not in medicine. And so in medicine, traditionally, what the field did, the discipline did was to try to reach out to communities to get people to enroll in trials. And, and uh, when you were talking about the Commonwealth and it's, it was talking about things it was doing around loneliness and isolation, it talked about building with community. So community engagement is really working with community and having community as partners in thinking through what needs to and thinking through what needs to be addressed, how to address it, and and then through that partnership, we should be able to come up with strategies that are better than either either side would come up with on their own. I, and and it was it was interesting because uh, you know for those of you who've been watching for a while, you know me. My my big thing is about building with and not for. And while I was researching Dr. Norris, there were at least two articles uh, that I'd read that said exactly that, <laughs> building with and not for the community. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's really nice to, to meet someone who does the same thing um, and kind of approaches it with the same philosophy in medical, uh, in the medical realm that I do in the art realm. Right. Um, so what is community partnered research and why is it so important to you? Community partnered research, again, is doing this research together. And, and it's so important to me because when we're doing it together, I'm getting ideas, recommendations from my community partners that I'm not gonna get from my medical colleagues. And, and so when we're thinking through how we're gonna address a problem, really having, having everybody at the table together and thinking who else who's not at the table and who needs to come to the table in order to make these projects work, that that's what makes it fun because you know at the end, because you know at the end you're gonna have a better product. And then because the product is co-developed by community, it's much more likely that members of the community are gonna say, I this makes a little more sense to me to uh, have a little more trust and confidence and the results of whatever this project is and what's, what's being done because it was co-created by us. Mm. And I mean, that's a, that's a 24 carat lesson right there. If you have a table, your first question should always be who is not at this table right now. Right. Right. Man. Um, so you've been, you've been doing this work a long time around community, community and academic partnerships. Right. Um, what are some of the results that you've seen throughout the years coming from from those partnerships? Man, it's uh, so to do it, been doing this for almost 30 years now. Oof. And, um, you know, got into it because of some community partner, you know, from doing some other work in community. But, um, you know, one project that, um, that I saw come out of community partnered work was a project looking at depression. And, and what they did was they created a randomized controlled trial, which usually doesn't happen with community. So this is where you're looking at one intervention versus another. And they looked at people with depressive symptoms and whether or not they went to be treated at county facilities or they went to community-based organizations to be treated. Mm. And at the end of the study, when they did the analysis, they found slightly better outcomes with going to community organizations than to county 
facilities to see a physician, but they saw significant improvement or significant reduction in homelessness developing among people with depressive symptoms if they were going to community-based organizations. And it was also significant reduction in cost. And so that project has led to both the County of Los Angeles and the VA hospital now using those strategies to address depression in the, and depressive symptoms in the community and try to uh, you know, reduce homelessness. Wow. Wow. So, oh man, that's, that's so deep to have your work be used as like almost a new foundation of, uh, of work being done civically. That's incredible. Um, so let's talk about diversity and inclusion in the medical field. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the current obstacles facing a more diverse and inclusive biomedical workforce? Yeah, that's a that's a tough question. That's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you just had a section on racism, right? So we have racism, we have structural racism. So we have these structures in place. We have mindsets in place, right? So if you think about it, there is a pool of individuals going through the educational system from K through 12. And the number of people of color that make it through that system and make it through with the skills and to perform at the level to be really considered for medical school is much lower than their white peers. And that's because in our K through 12 system, a black community gets about $2,300 per student per year less than a white community in school. Right. So if you think about the resources, you add all that up for all the students and all the classes every year, the amount of resources is so different. So we try to have like these called pipeline programs, special programs where you take some kids who are performing well. And that, that's nice. That gets some people there. But the, but we've missed already. We've missed so much talent in the first place. Right. Now they get to the place where they're sort of entering and they're interviewing for college, for medical school, for residency. And each time the bias that you just saw with the kids saying, who's smarter, who's better, and they're gonna say white over black, that's what happens for students coming through going to medical school, right? And so that makes it that that is why diversity is so challenging to mm -hmm. to address because we have all these barriers at multiple levels from such a young age too like that that was seeing the science behind that and watching them uh quiz those kids was so like we had one comment came in that said is anyone else crying <laughs> it was like <laughs> And I feel like a lot of us got a little choked up, you know, it was uh, when when my friend told me the story of his daughter, like it was so heart wrenching, um, man. And it, and it just I think that's the, like, you know, the, the old phrase of how do you eat an elephant? Right. One bite at a time. Right. Like so finding these different levels that, that we can continue to work on. Um, it's so it's so crucial. And so in a lot of ways and in a lot of realms, um, COVID has brought this lack of diversity and, and the inequity just across society to the forefront. Do you see any ways that it's done that in the medical field? Um, you know, there are numerous studies where, you know, black and, and native communities especially are getting hit harder. Uh, right. Where else are you seeing um, COVID bringing this lack of equity to the, to the forefront? Well, as, as you mentioned, it's, you know, so we're seeing it hit different communities disproportionately, right? So people get infected and then they have to come to the hospital. You know, if they're really sick, they come to the hospital and get treated. And, and then the main challenge we see there is there's a higher rate of being uninsured or underinsured, right? So you just had uh, highlighted with uh, this article where they're calling and the first thing you're asking is what type of insurance you have. Right. And so, and so that becomes a barrier that can lead to uh, at least a delay, if not 
no care at all, right? And so you have this delay, potential delay in care, and and a delay in care with something like COVID, when someone's really getting sick enough that they feel they need to go to the hospital, that delay in care can lead to really needing to go to the ICU and even dying, right? So this is not a not a situation where you can go about it leisurely when it's gotten to that point. And so I've heard stories from uh, friends of mine of patients who've gone to the hospital, uh, to emergency room, and they just get, you know, they go back and forth several times before finally they get admitted. And, and so when you see those things happening, uh, that, that, that raises, you know, additional concerns about the medical profession and how we are continuing to perpetuate reasons for mistrust by perpetuating mistreatment. And mm -hmm. again, like the Dahl study, compared to the Dahl studies done in the 1950s, it's better, but it's, it's, it's still not good, right? Mm -hmm. And so we, we, we have to do way, way better. <coughs> and, you know, we, uh, <coughs> I, like to, I like to consider myself a solution-oriented person. <laughs> um, so what, what steps do you see now, um, you know, that medical professionals can take to make that workforce a little more equitable and diverse? Are there, are there clear steps? Are there, um, you know, uh, what, what are our solutions here? What can we, what can we get working on right now for all the medical professionals? I want you to know, doc, that there <laughs> is. Half of the internet is tuned into this show right now. So we've now got medical talking. professionals. Now we're talking. Now we're talking. Yeah. <laughs> we've got medical professionals from all around the, the, the great country of ours tuned in. So what can we do to make the workforce more equitable and diverse? Right. So a lot of this is because of implicit biases we have because of what we are exposed to in society, right? That's what those children are responding to. Physicians are no different. We think we're different. We say, well, we're taking care of patients. We treat everybody the same. But there's actually data from physicians who have taken the Harvard implicit bias test or implicit attitude test that shows that physicians are actually more racially biased than the general population. So the first thing you have, we have to do as a profession is say, it could be me. But you have to recognize it could be you. The next thing you have to do is sort of you're engaging your pa with a patient, right? So these biases are, we've taken images and narratives about a group of, about groups of people. And we take that narrative of a group and we, lay, we put that label on each individual. If you can strip that group label away and just address the individual as they are and sort of come with a sense of empathy and caring and respect for the individual who's in front of you, that, that goes a long way, and, and particularly for taking care of patients. When we think about diversity in the workforce, when we look at the interview process, again, we have to think about how do we help physicians recognize that they may have these biases. And then what we do a lot is what's called a holistic review, where we try to take out of the interview process a lot of questions, components, and elements that are easy to have bias embedded in them. And so we try to take that out to minimize the amount of bias that can go into that process. And so I think those are the, some of the more immediate things we can do. And then, you know, at the end of the day, we need to continue to work on sort of anti-racism training and, and move society and, and then take away the structures in society that reinforce racism, right? So it, it's, it's easy to talk about doing these things, but as long as the structures in society from education to housing, to employment, to criminal justice, environmental justice, as long as those continue to say, we're gonna separate people by their race, by how they look, it's hard for people to Sort of reduce their biases that they have because every time they turn around, it gets reinforced that that bias is in fact appropriate. Mm -hmm. And I, I love what you what you said about being accountable and having to look in the mirror and say, "Is it us? 
it might be us. Um, yeah. And I think as uh, you know, y'all y'all can see me. Most of our most of our uh, audience can see me. So uh, you know, I I think it's so important for people who look like me, uh, for for the white family to to realize like, yo, we've been indoctrinated. You know what I mean? This isn't this isn't necessarily an attack on your character. It's that you you grew up in racism. We grew up in systemic racism. Right. Um, so you know it 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 isn't that you're purposefully being a racist, right? But you may have some of this programming in you, and we got blind spots um, as as humans just across the board. We have blind spots um, when it comes to seeing things in ourselves. So I, I love that accountability piece. I do believe that accountability is like one of the core ways that we can actually change and, and shift this for the next generation. Um, so man, just thank you for all the work that you're, that you're doing out here. Absolutely. And you know, what I, you know, when I give talks and about this and have these conversations, what I try to remind people is, you know, everyone on this live, nobody on this live stream owned a slave. Nobody on this live stream created structural racism, but we all have a chance to either help to dismantle it or to perpetuate it and mm -hmm. perpetuate it actively, or you can perpetuate it passively by not doing anything. Cause the way it's set up, the way society's set up, if you don't do anything, it just continues as it is. So there are two ways we can perpetuate it and is, and we can, or we can actively try to dismantle it. So while we may not have created it, we have the opportunity. We're all making a decision one way or another. And it's just up to us. Do we want a society grounded in equity and justice? Then we have to go to dismantle it. Or do we want to keep things the way they are? Then we make a different decision. Mm, mm. Couldn't have said it better myself, Doc. <laughs> uh, so I have one last question because this is the question I ask everyone uh, because I am an expert joy hunter myself. Uh, where's your joy coming from these days? My joy comes from, you know, working with more junior people and trying to help particularly underrepresented minorities get into and succeed in the medicine field um, and, and working with my community partners, right? So if I can, and, and helping people in the community succeed in whatever it is they want to succeed in to the extent I can. So as long as I feel like I'm giving back and making some contribution, that's like as, as good as it can get. Beautiful, beautiful. So uh, any, any last words that you would like to give the half of the internet that is watching this right now? <laughs> um, so since this is part of Masked Up and, and we've been talking about racism and, and, and mistrust and things like that, I think you know, when I give talks about COVID, I think it's very important. And you had sort of talked about this early. We want to be respectful of people's beliefs and views and where they are. And, and recognize particularly that a lot of mistrust is grounded in both historical and contemporary mistreatment. So I recognize that. But what I'm trying to tell um, many communities of color who are being hit really hard with the virus is think about and really consider taking the vaccine today so you can be alive and join the fight to fight fight against mistrust tomorrow. Mm, mm. Beautiful, Doc. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming on, Dr. Norris. Uh, it's been an incredibly enlightening conversation. And uh, just, you know, it makes me feel really good when I get to have these in-depth conversations with doctors like yourself. Um, you know, this is not, not everybody, not everybody gets to pick a, pick their doctor's brain when they're at the hospital and they're on their, their normal visit. Um, so just knowing that these conversations are being had and that these, these, these topics and these theories are being thought about, um, deeply and, and practiced, um, just really does my heart good. And I think it'll, it'll definitely like, you know, do the same for, the half of the internet that's watching right now. Um, so I just want to uh, want to say thank you for uh, coming on the show and joining us. You are now officially a friend of the show and you can drop in anytime. Well, thank so, you for uh, having me and I look forward to coming back 
any, you know, let me know. And yeah, it's my pleasure. Absolutely. We'll see you next time. All right. Take care. Y'all another, another amazing interview. Um, another medical professional that is actually working towards this accountability and, and you heard all about it. Uh, man, so awesome. So awesome. I get to interview the coolest people here. Um, so yeah, that, that just about does it for this episode of Masked Up. Uh, we're going to continue doing Black History Month next week. And we're also going to have some special Valentine's related stories for y'all. So uh, make sure you tune in. We do this every Monday night at 808. Shout out to our partners that protect us who make this. They're the ones who furnish me with this amazing studio. You know what I'm saying? I used to just do this in my house. Now I got a full studio. You see it? I had dancers earlier. Come on. Come on, y'all. So shout out to protect us. And, uh, you know, if you want to see more from me, I do the great joy hunt every morning, sometime between 10 and 11, whenever I wake up. So uh, you can follow me on Facebook, Andrew Defy, Andrew with a U, D-E-F-E-Y-E. And uh, you can tune in to the great joy hunt. And uh, let's see. Let's see. What am I going to take you all out with? I'm going to take you all out with one of my favorite videos that we've ever gotten as a submission here to Masked Up. This is MC Zeps and Sully with a little Masked Up Freestyle. All right, so I bring that mask over here, right? Hey, yo, check it out. Oh, oh. It's a yummy cake, listen to me, oh I'll say it fast I, I can't take a bite if I put on my mask But it's okay cause you heard me To go on a journey You don't want to catch those sickly journeys No, I need to get up back Yes To yeah. keep you safe You gotta cover your face yeah. Every time you go outside in the place yeah. You gotta be safe yeah, Was that a burp? That was cool. She's a good girl. She does so good in school. The one name at home, uh -huh. I can't wear a mask, so I can't be sick. I need to know, not wear a mask, only at like school. Or stores. Or stores. That's true. Keep your social distance. Yeah. Listen to the rhymes just for instance. Thank you very much. Don't forget to wear your mask on your nice little smile that was Sully and Daddy Freestyle.